guess where we are. Eastbourne Pier. Go on then, why are we here? Well, it's about the story of the New Brunswick. Um, well, more really to do with a lifeboat going to the aid of the New Brunswick in 1883. So it's the start of the story. Um, just an introductory. Uh, November the 25th, 1883, found a New Brunswick in trouble during the night in heavy weather. Top mast blown away and sails were torn to rags. Dawn found him off Beachy Head in a south-southwest gale driving them towards the rocks. The exhausted crew dropped their best two anchors, but these were found to be dragging and signalled for help. All right. So we're going to... Uh, well, they couldn't launch a lifeboat in New Haven, could they? So they had to nope. launch this Eastbourne one. But it was too rough. It was. So they had to drag it all the way over to Burling Gap. The lifeboat station is... Uh, just before the Martello yeah, Tower. The Martello Tower, yeah, just down there where that, where that tower is. Uh, and then we've got to do a hell of a walk. About five and a half miles, approximately. They did it in two hours. Yeah, dragging the lifeboat. We'll see how we get on. And we'll tell you about it on the way. Let's go. The following is taken from the Eastbourne Gazette, published on November the 28th, 1883. The New Brunswick was timber laden and was on her voyage from Quebec to Sunderland. The voyage from the American shores presented no particular features, but just at the entrance of the English Channel the unfortunate vessel was caught in a terrific storm. For some days she was driven helplessly before the wind, her top mast carried away and her sails torn to rags. The crew were utterly exhausted by their struggles during the gale, and to add to their misfortunes, when Sunday morning broke, they found themselves being helplessly driven on a rocky coast. As a last resource, they threw overboard their two best anchors. For a time they held, but soon afterwards they were felt to drag. They had hoisted signals of distress, but they could not detect any answer. At length, to their joy, several people were seen gathered on the shore, but they had no means of communication. The poor seamen could see as the tide fell that there were huge ridges of rock between themselves and the shore. Hour after hour passed, the storm increased in fury. At length, when hope was almost gone, they noticed that efforts were being made to get a boat down the cliff, onto the beach. Even when the boat started, the poor fellows feared that she could never reach their vessel. It seemed almost impossible that an open boat could live in such a storm. In this idea they were correct, and had not the William and Mary been constructed with the most improved appliances, a man by a daring hardy crew, it would have been impossible they could ever have been saved. It is only fair to the New Haven lifeboat crew to state that when they received the telegram from Eastbourne, they promptly manned their boat, but in the face of the terrific gale, they were unable to leave the harbour. The steam tug on which they generally rely to tow them out of the harbour was quite unprepared and it would have taken some time to get a steamer. Therefore, the attempt was given up as hopeless. After the crew had left the vessel, she remained moored at her anchors. And after the gale had subsided, the New Haven steam tug went out to her and managed to tow her into New Haven Harbour, where she now lies in safety. In all probability, she will be claimed as a derelict by the owners of the steamboat. The following description is again from the Gazette and gives a full story of the day's events and why after all that effort the entire lifeboat crew were dismissed. The piece was entitled The Eastbourne Lifeboat to the Rescue. The gallant rescue of the crew by the Eastbourne lifeboat and the difficulty in conveying the lifeboat to the wreck. Just at the moment when the mayor and corporation were leaving the vestry hall on Sunday morning last, a messenger arrived announcing a wreck off Beachy Head. Councillor John Bennett, sub-agent for Lloyds, immediately left the procession which had just been formed and after a hurried consultation with Alderman Rudd, Lloyds agent, hastened to the telegraph office and wired the information to New Haven. It was thought probable that they would be able to arrive at the wreck before the Eastbourne boat could get, get there, as there was a gale blowing from the south southwest direct into the teeth of the Eastbourne boat. It was a question whether it was advisable to dispatch the Eastbourne boat at all. Mr Emery, local secretary to the Lifeboat Institution, and Charles Hyde, coxswain of the boat, were consulted and it was determined to take the boat over land. It was very fortunate this decision was arrived at, because, as it will be subsequently seen, the New Haven boat never left the harbour and therefore the whole credit of the affair devolves upon the Eastbourne crew. While the consultation was going on, the Eastbourne crew mustered at their post and received the announcement with hearty cheers and at once set to work to drag the boat out of the house 
and had actually pulled it by manual labour to the end of South Street before the horses could be attached. In the first instance six horses were supplied by Mr Newman of the Anchor Hotel, but these were supplemented by four more supplied from other sources. The tug up the new road to Beachy Head was a terrible struggle and it required the full power of the ten horses with a crew and a host of volunteers of all classes of society who worked with a will to drag and push the heavy boat up the steep ascent, rendered ten times more difficult by the drenching rain which fell all the time and the gale which blew dead in their teeth. On however they went and in two hours reached Burling Gap down which it was necessary to take the boat before it could reach the shore. At that time the vessel could be dimly seen amid the drifting scud some three quarters of a mile from the shore with the sea at times breaking completely over it. The crew, lashed to the rigging, drenched to the skin with every passing wave were observed waving signals of distress. Right, well we've just walked down the seafront it was a bit more interesting, not so much traffic um, but this is where they would have dragged the lifeboat up can't quite see the uh, lifeboat station from here but how far is that? It's not far away. About a mile at the most. So, and we've now got to carry on up there. That's the end of the South Downs way. They come down here, and uh, yeah, and then we're going to go up this zigzaggy road up there, aren't we? Yeah. And then we'll pick it up from the top. See you there. Let's go. It was now about half past one o'clock in the day and there was every appearance of the storm increasing in violence as the tide had just turned. At this point, however, a difficulty arose, which it was thought at one time would render useless all the labour which had already been expended in bringing the lifeboat to the edge of the cliff. Those who know Burling Gap will remember that in ordinary times it is a narrow roadway just sufficiently wide to permit the passage of a car leading from the top of the cliff to the beach. But those who ventured down found that in the consequences of the severe storms which had lately prevailed, at the lower end the water had washed away the sloping road and there was a fall of fully 10 feet between the end of the road and the beach. This would have been in the most cases an insurmountable difficulty but when human lives are at stake Englishmen do not know what impossible means. Somebody discovered not far from the spot a load of timber and with these a temporary path was rigged out by the aid of the numerous bystanders who had at this time gathered on the scene. It was a remarkable sight to see gentlemen, fishermen, coast gardeners visitors of all classes tugging and pulling and hauling away and bringing this wood to the spot and erecting the temporary roadway down which the lifeboat was safely lowered. Reaching the water's edge at length the dangers and difficulties were by no means surmounted. A perfect hurricane prevailed and the waves rolled in mountains high threatening to submerge everyone within their reach. A dense black cloud came drifting from the ocean and just as the lifeboat was launched burst with a terrific fury on the shore. There are few living who can ever remember such an awful elemental strife in this country. The rain did not descend in ordinary drops, it literally came down in bucketfuls. And yet undeterred by this terrible downpour, the gallant lifeboatmen crew went on their way to save. Oh, right, so we've, now we've got to the top of the hill. Oh, where do you reckon they would have gone then? Well, they would probably have come up the, the little wiggly road up here and then probably come up on the top and then most likely take a direct route down over to Burling Gap over the other side of the farm there. Right. Uh, we're going to take the uh, South Downs Way uh, purely because it's an easy route and it keeps us uh, next, to the, next to the sea and it's quite a nice scenic route. Uh, it's quite a feat getting up that hill with those horses. Yeah, it was hard enough for us just walking up there, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right. Good. Onwards. Well, from just over, just over there, you can see Eastbourne. I can't quite see it here, but if you've seen Quadrophenia, that's where they stop on their on their little scooters and they look down over Eastbourne. And, says, uh -huh. and he says, "There it is, lads. Brighton." <laughs> <laughs> bit of artistic license. We yeah. like a bit of that. <laughs> can I have an ice cream? No, we haven't got time. Now go to the pub. No, we haven't got a time. We've got to go all the way over, all the way over there. We are not going to the pub. We're not. No, no, no. When they pulling that lifeboat all the way down here, they didn't stop and go to the pub, did they? They just had to crack on with it and get on with it, didn't they? We're not going to the pub. 
We're not. No, we're going this way. Well, we haven't got a lifeboat, so we might as well just come to the pub. Cheers. To those standing on the beach, it seemed impossible that the boat could ever reach the wreck. Again and again, it appeared to be overwhelmed by the waves and was lost to view altogether. And the bravest men on the shore watched with bated breath, expecting every moment to see the lifeboat thrown back on the shore, a helpless wreck. Slowly but surely, Charles Hyde and his gallant crew approached the ship. At times they were forced back, their boat filled with water. But the valves and other apparatus worked perfectly, and the boat was soon again clear. For fully one hour did this struggle continue. It seemed almost beyond endurance, but British pluck at length prevailed and the wreck was reached. It was impossible to take the boat alongside and a rope therefore was made fast and the lifeboat allowed to drop astern. One by one, the crew of 10 men with the captain dropped into the water and dragged into the lifeboat. One poor fellow, we are sorry to say, got his ribs crushed while being thus transferred, but all were saved and at length the lifeboat was once again turned to the shore with its precious cargo of human lives. The beach was safely reached where scores of ready hands were ready to drag it out of danger. The injured man was carried to one of the Coast Guard cottages where his immediate wants were attended to by Mr. Scanlon, assistant to Dr. Colgate, who fortunately happened to be present. The work of the lifeboat crew was not yet over. They had to get their boat up the gap, a work of no ordinary difficulty. Once the rope broke and the boat slipped back and several had narrow escapes, at length an anchor was made fast and by a little skill and much labour the good boat William and Mary was raised to the top of the cliff once more in safety. Fortunately Mr Bennett before starting had taken the precaution to call at the Devonshire Hotel and Mr Gardner had driven over with a copious supply of bread and meat and ale which was very acceptable not only to the crew but all those who had been working so indefatigably in getting the lifeboat launched. An eyewitness described what went on in a letter he wrote to the paper. Only those persons who undertook the journey from Eastbourne to Burling Gap know what obstacles had to be overcome and what efforts were required to drag the lifeboat up the sides of hills and across ploughed fields, even with the assistance of horses. Then, when Burling Gap was reached, fresh difficulties arose. The gap was too narrow for the boat's carriage to pass through and also finished abruptly with a drop of some eight or ten feet towards the sea. But with the aid of long planks and balks of timber, a rough slipway was made and the lifeboat was lowered by ropes a few feet at a time. The next task was launching her, which without the carriage and in the face of a wind blowing almost dead on shore, promised to be a task of considerable difficulty. However, with the same spirit which had animated the crew from the very beginning, she was safely launched and in a blinding squall of wind and rain, the men were the men were rescued from the half-wrecked bark and landed in a very exhausted condition. It would seem almost unfair to mention names when all the crew did their level best, but the coolness of the cox Charles Hyde, better known probably as Bones, when he stood on the top of the gap and gave instructions, sometimes verbally and sometimes by merely a motion of the hand, while the boat was being lowered through it, and when again after being the first in the boat and having seen the cable bent and everything in order, he took his place at the helm was enough to inspire the crew with confidence and win the admiration of the spectators. He was, without doubt, the right man in the right place, and what I have said of him will apply in all great measure to the whole of his crew, not one of whom showed the least sign of flinching, but a steady fixed look of determination is shown in every face to rescue the men in danger if possible. At any risk to themselves, and when one of them called out just before the word was given to let her go, wish us God speed, mates, and a safe return. The wish was evidently re-echoed in every heart and ringing cheers greeted them as their gallant boat took to the water. And soon in the teeth of the wind and sea reached her goal, so pluck and perseverance won the day. And all honour to our brave lifeboat crew, and now surely they deserve some more substantial reward than the barren honour of the credit of having nobly done their duty. Well you'd think so wouldn't you? But no, they all got fired instead. So why, after all that effort and all that praise, were the lifeboat crew dismissed? The details of the case that you will remember are as follows. On the 25th of November last, a lifeboat went and replied to signals of distress to the assistance of the Norwegian bark, the New Brunswick, and succeeded in rescuing the crew, consisting of 11 persons. For this service, the lifeboat men were enumerated by the institution, double pay being awarded them in consideration of the merits of this service rendered. In addition to this, they received £20 from the donor of the boat 
and about £70 collected at the town of Eastbourne. Subsequently, the coxswain, on the part of the lifeboat crew, made a claim on the owners of the unfortunate vessel for life salvage, and as such action being in direct contravention of the rules of the institution, and notwithstanding a warning which the crew received on the subject, they willfully persisted in their claim and obtained £105, of which amount they forwarded £15 to the RNLI as the boat's shares of the salvage money. This last mentioned sum the committee have returned to the owners of the New Brunswick. I am further instructed by the committee to request that you will bring this letter under the notice of your committee and that your committee will communicate the decision contained therein to the lifeboat crew and also take steps to give the matter full publicity in Eastbourne and the neighbourhood. Accordingly, Charles Hyde was sent for and his appearance before the committee, the chairman, communicated the conclusion came to and while expressing his regret that so painful a duty should devolve upon him, he explained that the committee had really had no choice in the matter but were under an obligation to dismiss all of the members of the present crew from the service of the institution. The dismissal of the crew will be received by the inhabitants with mingled feelings of surprise and regret and no doubt there will be a strong divergency of opinion re relative to the action of the men. It is, perhaps, only right to explain that the claim made by the crew for life salvage was consequent only upon the claim of the New Haven crew who, assisted by the steam tug, the tipper, towed the ill-fated vessel into New Haven Harbour. The men belonging to the New Haven boat claimed and received salvage amounted to something like £300. Not unnaturally, the Eastbourne men, who, who had, as it were, borne the heat and burden of the day, had heroically encountered a tempestuous sea at the risk of their own lives and succeeded in bringing safely to shore the 11 members of the crew whose lives had been in the utmost jeopardy were annoyed to think that their neighbours who failed to do anything on the day of the wreck should receive the largest share of pecuniary reward and as the New Haven crew refused to waive their claim the Eastbourne men persisted in their demand for compensation for life salvage. They were warned by the RNLI that their action would be a direct violation of one of the leading principles governing the operations of the institution, and that if it persevered it would unavoidably necessitate their severance from the institution. The situation is one of considerable importance, since it is evident there will be the greatest possible difficulty in replacing the crew. We understand that a movement is on foot for securing another lifeboat to be manned by the dismissed men, and that several contributions have already been promised with a view to that end. On Wednesday evening, Hyde and his mates were driven through some of the streets with the flag taken from the back of the New Brunswick. Born aloft, a band accompanied the party. I'll leave the last word to Charlie Hyde. No one regrets more than your humble servant that the statement should go forth that we are ungrateful to public sympathy and support. We beg most humbly to tender to those who so kindly responded to the appeal for our joint benefit and most grateful thanks for so handsome a tribute to our humble endeavours to save life. Thank God for his bounteous mercy we are the means of saving 11 lives from the grasp of the merciless ocean in the face of every obstacle. Such we are ready to do again and again whenever necessity arises. Now for explanation. Why should the New Haven crew that in no way assisted to rescue life receive the sum of £300 when called upon to save life? The same was left to Eastbourne, who happily succeeded. Now, as uneducated men, our crew thought thus, life should stand before everything, but to their mind cargo stands the most appreciated and life the least paid, so that for towing a ship into harbour in fine weather they received £300 salvage. Your humble servants who risked life to save life have to rest contented with a paltry remuneration given under the excuse no life salvage is granted and all service is given voluntarily. Do the heads in office give their services free? Do they risk their lives? No. Then why expect an untutored fisherman to give his service free when he takes his life in his hands? In conclusion, we beg most respectfully to state that to a man we refuse to enlist under the national lifeboat rules again. The crew to a man refuse but we do not intend to remain idle. Should occasion arise, you will find us the same. We shall in all cases that may arise strive to do our duty to our country and our fellow men. Boat or no boat, we may perhaps find some kind friends to render us independent of all such unjust rules and regulations. It does seem that the RNLI and Bones had a change of heart and he did go back to the lifeboat. I'll put the newspaper article relating to that in the bilge wrap 
Facebook. Uh, links to that are in the description. Well, five and a half miles. Three hours. And now we've got to walk all the way back again. <laughs> At least we'll have the wind behind us this time. Let's crack on. George Mears, a little known artist from Brighton, he used to travel to Newhaven to paint the various ships coming and going. He did actually capture the steam tug tipper towing the New Brunswick into Newhaven Harbour. Well that's it for the New Brunswick, thanks for watching. Uh, hopefully the next video will be about putting the engine back into the boat so we can uh, soon be getting on with doing some more underwater adventuring.